Okay, this is our ninth session tonight out of the 12 sessions that were uh, the 12 evenings that were uh, uh, setting aside to hear some of the prophetic history of what the Lord has spoken to uh, over the years. Now, session eight and session nine, we are focusing on the subject of healing and the promises of healing. I said last night that there were 17. I, I, I uh, as I was looking over the, our, all of our story, that I found an, an 18th one. And so, uh, 18 different times in a, in a, uh, specific prophetic event, the Lord has emphasized that he wants healing to be released. Now I'm going to give you a couple of scriptures real quick, and then we're going to get right into the story. And what these scriptures are is to help understand the, some of the other dynamics that go along with healing. Because, uh, sometimes we, we think of healing as it will be fun. It will be exciting. There'll be crowds, I'll finally be rich and famous when the Lord anoints me or some version of that. And there's so many other dynamics. That's the natural human default button. Excitement, opportunity, whoa, whoa. And a lot of people are excited about healing and they've never really connected the dots in their thinking as to the real fundamental reason why they're excited. And there are a number of different dynamics that the Lord is uh, really committed to in the subject of healing. The first one we're going to look at, very, very quick, John chapter 5, verse 20. It's the subject of the relationship of healing to intimacy with God and His people. Subject, I mean, the subject of, of God releasing healing in context, intimacy. The reason I'm going to just read this verse and one other uh, on on the subject on the subject is so that in a few moments we're gonna uh, I'm gonna tell a testimony about it, but I want you to know there is a there there is an intimacy dimension to healing as well between the one the Lord uses in healing and the Lord Himself. John five verse twenty, Jesus speaking, for the Father loves the Son, and the Father shows him all things that He Himself does, and He will show him greater works than these. So that unbelieving people, so that the crowds would would marvel at God. The idea is that when the Father shows His love to the Son, He shows Him greater works. There is an intimacy dimension. Look at John 15, verse 15. John 15, verse 15. Now Jesus takes the same principle and He applies it to us. He says, no longer do I call you servants, of course, in the word of God, we are still called the servants of God. That's a little different context. Jesus is using the word different here. He says in the middle of the verse, I have called you friends. And he says the same language that he said about him and the father. For all things I have heard from my father, I've made known to you. In other words, I'm going to show you the things I'm doing, the greater miracles. And he links this to friendship. I just wanted to make that point uh, real quick. Turn to one more passage, and then we're going to go right to the testimony. Second uh, Corinthians chapter twelve, where we were last night. Second Corinthians chapter twelve, and I'm going to draw from these principles through the testimonies. Second Corinthians twelve. <clears throat> okay, uh, verse one to ten is all about a uh, Paul uh, having the heavenly experiences and moving in in verse one, two, and three. I mean, verse one to four. He has the heavenly experiences. Let's call that the prophetic anointing plus one. He has a profound prophetic anointing, verses one to four. In uh, verse nine, when the Lord speaks to him, Paul references having uh, 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 perfected power. He's talking about uh, the power of God would be perfected in him. He says, my strength is made perfect when you're in weakness. The strength of God or the power of God is perfected. So he operated in the in perfected power, verse 9. We can call that signs and wonders. He was operating in the prophetic anointing, verse 1 to 4, heavenly visitations, etc., etc. Now, but here's, here's the issue that's very important. Verse 7 to 9 here is that he says, Lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance, by the prophetic anointing, or he could go ahead and reference verse 9, or by the perfected power, the signs and wonders. He goes, the abundance of the prophetic, a lot of heavenly experiences, and a lot of signs and wonders cause even a mature apostle to exalt themselves. 
What's amazing to me is Paul is a very, very mature apostle, and yet he has, an, a, he has a propensity to exalt himself in a way he doesn't even know, he's not even in touch with. And the Lord says, I'm going to let trouble touch your life because you have an unperceived problem. You don't know about it. It's, it was surprising to Paul, undoubtedly, because when he asked the Lord, hey, lift this problem, lift this problem, lift this problem, and the Lord appears to him, or I'm, I'm assuming, or at least speaks to him in some manner and says, no, there's a, there's a reason I'm not lifting the problem. Because you have an unperceived area in your life you're not in touch with. It's the uh, tendency to exalt yourself even as a mature apostle. Now, there's two things that make the human heart exalt themselves. Well, there's many, but there's two very powerful ones. Abundant revelation and abundant power with signs and wonders. And the reason the human heart gets exalted with abundant revelation, abundant power, it's far more powerful than money is actually. Because of, of, just surely because of the law of supply and demand. There are so few people on the earth with abundant revelations and abundant power. And there's lots of millionaires. I mean, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of millionaires, but there's not very many people with that. The millionaires get in line. The kings of nations get in line to touch this. This is the most, uh, this is a heady wine, if I can just use a, a natural term. Moving in power and moving in revelation is not something that happens in a vacuum. It's not something that that makes no impact. It is dangerous. It's shark-infested waters, a term I like to use. Moving in this causes the heart of the of the mature apostle to get exalted. And what the Lord says, he goes, I'm going to, in essence, there's a principle that we've talked about for years, that God protects his anointed vessel with problems. You want the power of God, understand you're going to get part of the protection policy of the power of God on your life is problems. That's part of the protection clause of God. Here's why. Because when the human heart gets lifted up, it gets into the arena of what's Lucifer got into, and you get under the judgment of God. And the Lord says, I'm going to let you have some extra struggles alongside of this, because if you get into the other arena of being exalted, then there's a judgment that I have to put on you. Now, this is a thing that uh, that Balaam was trying to do with the children of Israel. Uh, he was trying to uh, get the children of Israel into sin through false prophesying, trying to get them into sin so that God would become the adversary of the people of God. And the Lord says, I'm not going to let my end-time church get into an adversarial role with me. I'm going to keep them humble, and i got a whole strategy to keep them humble. Because if they get proud, I become adversarial with pride because I am humility incarnate. Humility and pride cannot connect together. And so the Lord is basically telling Paul, Paul, you got heady wine. You've got the highest revelation, the greatest miracles, anyone in the world. Maybe John the Apostle, one or two others. And, uh, I mean, kings of nations don't have what you have. And, uh, Paul, you're human. You're, you're my, my dear one. And I'm going to protect you by allowing some problems to enter in. And those problems with the anointing, with the yes in your spirit, all of that combination. I don't want to go through that right now. The whole equation works to where you and I stay in a real good intimate relationship and we don't get adversarial. And Paul goes, Oh. Oh, I, I didn't understand that. So he goes, here's the deal. I'm going to allow some weakness. I'm going to allow some struggle in order to balance the equation because you got so much. Now, here's the reason I'm saying that. As I'm sharing these testimonies, people are going, uh, wow, this is going to get fun. Wow, this is going to be exciting. The principle of Scripture, the principle of history is this. Greater power always, always brings greater problems. Always. And to the uninstructed uh, Bible student, they are shocked in their pursuit of power, when they also run into an increase of problems. They thought, now I thought there was this realm where I just moved in power and all the nations thought it was awesome and things were in tranquility. It does not happen that way. That's not a biblical concept. And so if I'm going to give 18 stories, or even reference just a few of them, I didn't give the whole story, I have to have equal time to what happens when these promises happen. I'm not going to take equal time tonight. I'm going to do that on other occasions. These things will cause problems for your domestic tranquility. 
it seriously will be disrupted, a thorn in the flesh, a messenger from Satan buffeted Paul because he moved in higher realms of power, and it's true all through history. And the reason, again, because God's saying, listen, I- I'm, I'm releasing power so we can be intimate friends. I'm not releasing power so that you and I become adversarial and you don't have the ability to keep yourself in check. So I'm going to help you out. I've told the Lord for years, Lord, I'm different than the other guys. <laughs> Lord, really, I- I'm different. I- I'm not like the others. And the Lord says, yeah, yeah, I know. I-, I hear this thousands of times all over the earth and uh, millions of times. Of course, I'm making that up. He didn't really say that. But the point is, I am no different. You are no different. If Paul the Apostle, in his mature apostolic ministry, needed problems to help keep the thing in balance, beloved, and I look at these 18 promises, put your seatbelt on. If you think the point of this is so finally your little boring, seemingly unimportant ministry becomes famous and you become important one day, that's not the reason for these promises. And there's a lot of spiritual fantasy in the body of Christ and the houses of prayer, whatever they want to call them. In the gatherings of fasting and prayer for the breakthrough of power, there's a significant amount of spiritual fantasy because they don't understand it's about them entering into intimacy with God and becoming servants of God's people. They don't understand that part of it. They really, really don't. They're trying to get delivered from a little, seemingly insignificant, boring ministry so life can get fun. And that's kind of the bottom drive. And the Lord says, I am going to disrupt that idea entirely before I anoint you. And that's uh, kind of the, uh, the chapter that a lot of us have been in the last 10 years in our lives. Because we have an unperceived spiritual fantasy about how we'll be different and we'll move in power and it's really going to make things good. And the Lord says, what I want good is my intimacy with you and your ability to bring my deliverance to broken people. That's what we want good. Not finally you get the big this and the big that and the big this and the big that. And now you've made it and now you can tell your mom you did amount to something after all. It's not about that. That's not why I'm going to heal you. I mean, that's not why I'm going to anoint you. And, uh, and I, I think if we can sign up for the right reasons, even though signing up for them and is not the same thing as entering into the reality of them, but the Lord will help us. He's really good at that. If we sign up and aim for the right reasons to move into this thing, I tell you, we can, we can save a lot of confusion and hardship. If what I'm saying in these 18 uh, testimonies, uh, a prophetic uh, uh, confirmations of healing, and there's more besides those, if these are true, and they are, And you are called to be a part of this, and many of you in this room are. You have trouble waiting for you. And it's only fair, if I am a friend to you, and a true shepherd in the flock, you have to know with the same amount of energy that you walk away going, wow, this is awesome. You have to under, you have to whisper and terrifying. You have to say that or you've not understood what's going on here. And I don't mean terrifying. Uh, I'm not more afraid than than, than I am awestruck before God, but I'm telling you, uh, I don't like hassle. I don't like turmoil. I don't like oppression. I don't like getting hit. I don't like any of that stuff. And those things come. That's all I'm trying to say. I don't mean terrifying in the sense we're going to spirit of fear. That's not what I mean. But it is like, ugh. Oh, no, you're getting it. You're getting it. Okay. Holy Spirit's committed. We're going to end up leaning on our beloved coming out of the wilderness. We're coming out of the wilderness, yes. We're coming out in victory, yes. But we'll come out leaning and limping. That's a fact. We will come out leaning. We will come out limping. Okay, the first uh, 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 story I'm going to share tonight is not doesn't have any uh, special confirmation to it, but it was so important that I just want to throw it in. It's really the message. Uh, uh, Bob uh, Jones has one of his uh, uh, encounters with the Lord. And which I'm not going to go through the details of it. It doesn't, uh, that, that's not the point I want to emphasize. And the Lord tells him great powers coming on this people. Great power. But he tells him this. He says, go and tell them, I'm going to anoint them to establish servanthood. I just mentioned intimacy with God a minute ago. But this is a different one. He goes, tell them I'm, I'm going to anoint them in order to establish servanthood because I am a servant. I am the anointed one. He's, he's interacting with the Lord. I am the servant. And I want to anoint them to be like me and to do what I did. And then uh, the Lord spoke to Bob and says, tell them this. 
And this is supposed to frighten you a little bit, or, or at least unnerve you. I, if I say frighten, you'll say, oh, he's putting a spirit of fear on us. Let me change the language. This is supposed to unnerve you, what I'm going to say next, not excite you. He says, the Lord told Bob, he says, go and tell them that when I begin to release this uh, healing power, there, the, there will be no end to the lines. And I said, you know, I was about 28, 29 or whatever. And I said, wow. And he goes, no, Mike, exact opposite response. You're supposed to go, oh. You're, he goes, that is a heavy, heavy promise. It's got more of kind of a warning than a promise. He goes, do you have any idea what it looks like when there's no end to the line? I said, I just like a line. You know, I just like to try a line once and see what it's like. <laughs> and he says, uh, uh, the Lord, uh, and I don't know if it was Bob or the Lord, but whatever, but it, out of this, Bob said, he says, the Lord is going to, uh, he's going to tear down the spiritual fantasy in the heart of the people who are pursuing the anointing. He said, there's much, much spiritual fantasy, much spiritual fantasy about uh, the personal glory they, that they secretly, even unknowingly, relate to the promise of the anointing, their own personal glory. They're not even aware of it. And it's a fantasy the Lord is going to tear down. And it says it will surprise many of them. Many of them will be surprised. And so the Lord says, I'm coming in kindness to, to give you a, uh, the idea of it is to give us a little tip off to prepare us. It's about servanthood. It's about servanthood. One of the things I appreciate so much about Bob Jones over the years. Oh my goodness. I've, I mean, it is, it, it's staggering to me to have watched this. I have watched Bob Jones because he believes this. He was truly an embodiment of this. I have watched him, not that you have to do just this because it's unusual. I have watched him pray for people eight and ten hours a day, one-on-one. -on -one. Hundreds and hundreds of times. You know, when... uh I was in my mid-20s. He's in his mid-50s. And uh, uh, he was uh, not in great shape physically. And he still isn't. And uh, just the way his body felt. And, and him being a bit older than I was, we would be in the same morning at the same conference. And in the afternoon, I said, man, I kind of got to take a little break. And he never commented on it. And he just stayed there right through. And then I'd come back and 6.30, you know, before the 7 o'clock meeting, and he's still there. I go, Bob, what are you doing? He goes, well, the lines aren't in, and the Lord told me about that. And I go, well, Bob, we got a meeting, like, right now. And he says, that's okay. And then he'd be there from 9, 10, 11. I went, this happened all the time. I go, Bob, this is not okay. He says, this is how it is, Mike. This is how it is. He goes, this is what I signed up for. He goes, I'll never see most of these people ever again. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it so that I become their friend. I'll never know them. I'm doing it because this is how the Lord does it. This is his way. He goes, this is where this thing is going. And uh, he pointed out to me, he says, you know what? He goes, the one thing that, about the spiritual fantasy that is in so many people's minds about healing, he says, when the Lord calls them out in a crowd and calls, says, you're going to have a healing ministry, they always go, oh, I knew it. They're all thinking about their personal importance in front of multitudes. He goes, and almost always God means one-on-one -on -one in a hospital room for five hours at a time. Almost always, God means in a lonely place at the side for hours, and they almost always think crowds and getting a sense of importance because of the crowd. He goes, it's just fantasy everywhere. And that's what uh, I just, that's what I loved about John G. Lake. That's what I loved. It, uh, the, this guy had this world famous ministry. He wanted to pull himself aside and go to these healing rooms. I mean, healing rooms. You know, I could picture healing rooms, I, you know. Well, we got them now, but I, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking over the years, just that's work. That's work. I, I mean, these healing rooms, rooms were kind of more, were more, uh, unnerving to me than IHOP was. And I mean, I thought IHOP 24 seven. I mean, because we did prayer meetings for all those, you know, 20 years, uh, before we started IHOP daily, near daily for 20 years. And then I labored through those 10, uh, prayer, 10 people, prayer meetings, no anointing, 6 a.m. I did thousands of those. And I'm thinking 24 seven. Now, one day I said, yes, God, it's awesome. The other day I'm going, oh, 84 of those a week till the second coming. Unbelievable. That's how I thought of IHOP. Then the next day I would think, Lord, this is our gift to you to be able to love you this way. And then the next day with 84 of these a week. 
until the second coming. And if they, somebody just gets tired of it, they just quit. And I'm hitting this thing for life. I went, oh, no. I mean, this isn't going to go away in eight weeks or eight years. This is it till the end. Now, of course, the Lord's going to breathe on it and it's going to. But anyway, I thought of IHOP in reality for years thinking, gee. Then when the Lord began to say healing rooms, I went, oh, that's even. Oh, man. <laughs> We're talking two or three in a room, the same person for an hour at a time sometimes, just soaking prayer. I go, that's work. That takes a servant. And that's what the Lord's into. And the Lord says, I'm going to anoint you, but you have to know it's about intimacy, number one. Number two, it's about servanthood, and those are both top of the list. It's not one is higher than the other. And number three, there are going to be problems to protect the heart of the people of God who are, who are excited with too much spiritual fantasy, but the Lord's too jealous to become their adversary because they get exalted in pride because they have a law of supply and demand going on. They have something so dynamic, the kings of the earth will wait in line for it. He says, the Lord says, I'm not going to lose my people over the healing anointing. I'm going to, I'm going to keep them as my dearly beloved friends because I'm going to show them the greater works. Okay, so that was the first one about the servanthood. <clears throat> okay, now we're going to get to, uh, going to kind of move on to the, uh, some dynamic stories of the fact that it's coming. But don't forget, when it comes, problems come, servanthood comes, and God's zeal to keep intimate with you comes too. All of those things work together to make life in the natural uh, uh, have a several tensions to our life in the natural. Okay, it's March 1985. March 1985. Uh, Bob has one of his uh, heavenly encounters with the Lord. And again, it seems like he has so many. Well, the truth is he has had so many compared to uh, my, uh, myself or you or others. But, but it was really, it was mostly 83 and 84 was the intensity. And, and though Bob is, is still operates in that, but it was, it, I've known him for these many years. There was no season like 83 and 84. Although it, uh, I believe that the, the prophetic anointing is in the days ahead is going to far surpass anything Bob Jones or Paul Kane has entered into. But anyway, the, the, Lord, the Lord stands uh, uh, before him. But he doesn't know it's the Lord. The Lord comes uh, uh, in, in a face that he's not familiar with. Now, now, the Lord can show himself to you any way that he wants. One day... I mean, one time the Lord reveals himself to us, to a prophet with radiance and the prophet falls down like a dead man. The next time the Lord reveals himself without the radiance, but in the, but in his true colors as to who he is. I mean, he shows himself as Jesus and speaks to a message, but, uh, turns the radiance down so he can communicate to the servant. And another time the Lord appears with a different face. Because part of the appearing of the, the face that the Lord uses is part of the message. And, and there's, a, there's a lot to say about that. I don't want to get off on a 30-minute uh, teaching on that. But that, that, that is a, a powerful fact uh, in Scripture and in the Word of God where the Lord shows himself. I mean, he appears to Abraham in, in, in what's it, Genesis 18. He's like a man, you know, having a, a meal with him. And then uh, the, the two, of the, the three of them are there. The two angels move on into Sodom and Gomorrah. And the third one says, da 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 da. Says, thus says the Lord. And then he's, and Abraham's going, oh my goodness, that was the Lord. That's amazing. But anyway, the Lord can appear at any level of brightness and splendor or lack of it that he wants. And so, and that's a principle Bob has understood. But the Lord's standing in front of him. He doesn't know it's the Lord. And he has this name written on his garment. And the name is, is Dominus. Dominus. And in Latin, that means the Lord. It's written somewhere on his garment. And, uh, uh, and Bob, uh, asked him, well, I'm going to give you one, uh, just one more example. Uh, is it what Hebrews chapter one or chapter two? It says, uh, sometimes you entertain angels unaware. You're actually, uh, failing to show hospitality and it's an angel that you're standing in front of but you were not aware of because the angels didn't sh show up in the glory realm. They showed up in looking like people. And so uh, that's a biblical idea that the glory diminishes and increases depending on what the occasion of the Lord is. But anyway, the, the Lord's, uh, Bob's looking at this. He knows it's a heavenly being. He's looking straight at him and he's going, you know, I, he, Bob just came out because he was smiling at him. He was very tender, very warm. And uh, he said he had this, the biggest grin on his face. He's looking at him. He goes, hi, Bob, or, or whatever. I don't know whether it was hi, Bob. Just something, a greeting of warmth and tenderness and smiling. 
And Bob says, he, he goes, I was looking at him going, who is it? Well, I don't know what's going on right now because it's big grand. And finally, Bob says, who are you? And he says, I'm the Lord. And Bob looks at him. He goes, you're the Lord. He says, yes. He goes, but I'm showing myself to you as your friend. I am the Lord, but I am your friend. And uh, Bob looked up the word dominus and found out in Latin it means the Lord. So it's, the Lord could have said, hey, I'm wearing my name. It's right in front of you. And uh, John 15, verse 15, we just looked at it. The Lord says, I call you my friend. And therefore, I'm going to release, I'm going to show you what I'm doing. And that showing, again, is a reference to his own conversation with his father in John 5.20. When the father shows the son what he's doing in greater works than these, it's related to miracles. And so the Lord looks at him. He says, I'm going to reveal healing power to you. But I'm going to reveal healing power in context and context to tender friendship to, towards you. He goes, I want it because the Lord revealed to him that he's going to uh, release the healing anointing in order to pr in order to anoint the heart of the servant, because that's what God's like. But this is an entirely different idea. He says, I'm going to release anointing, a uh, healing anointing to uh, to uh, strengthen, not to strengthen, but just in context to my tender friendship with you. I am your friend. And we can say friend and use the word father. We can use friend and use the word bridegroom. It's the tender heart of God to commune with his people. And he's going to commune with us in the context of miracles as well. And that's one of the reasons why the Lord's going to allow trouble to come. Because when our friendship with him gets disrupted, because the miracles make us so proud, we get out of sync with our friendship. And part of the healing anointing is about friendship. It's just a new idea to, to some people. And so... The Lord tells him that. He goes, I'm going to uh, reveal my healing power, but in context to tender friendship. And, Bo and he's smiling. And, and Bob's thinking, this is marvelous. Lord, this is, who thought of this? No, th those are actually my words. But I always like to know who thought of it. That's just the question I always ask. What a great idea to run the kingdom through healing with friendship. Well, that is a great idea. Okay, I'm going to put this uh, testimony on pause for a second. I'm going to tell you a Paul Kane story, then come back to this testimony. I remember the first time I, I uh, met Paul Kane in uh, April of 1987. And uh, uh, so I, it's a, it's a, there was so, oh, okay, I'm jumping into a big story, but I'm going to keep it small. I, I know a lot about Paul before I meet him. There you have it. So I have a lot of expectation. I'm meeting him. Here it is. Here it is. I'm meeting him, and I'm so excited. So uh, I don't want to tell that uh, why that was so exciting, but here I am. Whoa, it's happening. And uh, so we go out and to a restaurant, and Paul's telling me uh, he, his life story, and then we go to a restaurant, it's just the two of us. And so the strangest, the oddest thing happens. Uh, we're right there in the aisle. <laughs> this is so strange, so get ready. And... Uh, uh, Paul says, uh, Mike, he says, uh, uh, we're right in the aisle. He goes, could, would you mind if we moved over there? All the food's on the table. And he says, could we move over there by the uh, wall over there? And I said, uh, sure. Why? He goes, because I'm tired. I just met him. You know? He said, okay. So I, the lady comes up. I go, can we move over by the wall? And she goes, well, like, well, is something wrong? I says, yeah, my friend's tired. She went, <laughs> Okay. So we get over there, and I go, Paul, I, I, I'm not understanding. Whoa, you're tired. It seems like it was more work to, to move than we could have stayed. It had been easier. He said, no, no. He said, uh, you know, the meeting we just come out of, he says, the spirit of the Lord is still resting on me. He goes, I'm sitting here, and we're in the walkway. He says, uh, the lady that we're talking to, the waitress, she's got kidney problems. She said, he says, the guy over here is getting a divorce. That guy's a homosexual. He goes, it's just wearing me out. Let's get out of the walkway. I said, Real? Whoa. <laughs> so the lady came back and I said, uh, ma'am, I said, do you have kidney problems? She goes, how'd you know that? I said, oh, just, just asking. I go, do you have kidney problems? She goes, how did you know that? <laughs> I look at Paul and Paul kind of says, you know, one of those deals. And then I, 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 I have to know, you know, I just have to know. So I go over to the guy over there and I said, uh, the one with the marriage, the one with the marriage. <laughs> 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 
And let's let's make a, 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 a an odd story short. I found out it was the true word of the Lord. And I came back and I said, Paul, this is staggering. I go, let's do it, man. I've been my whole life praying and fasting and trying to get this stuff going. Let's just have the meeting right here. Because I've done a, a, a few restaurant, you know, lift my voice things. It was never effective, but I thought, here's a real one. <laughs> We did that a few times in our uh, in, the, in the early days and thought the Lord would bless it, and he didn't. And uh, I thought, man, I mean, I got three right here on the line, man. They're, you know, live fish. Let's do it. And Paul says, oh, no, 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 no. I said, Paul, why would God give it to you if we're not supposed to get up? And this is, this is awesome. I mean, let's do it. And he goes, no, 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 no. He goes, this happens all the time, all the time. I said, and you don't do anything with it? He goes, oh, no, no. I, this has been going on for years and years and years. Because I do sometimes at meetings at a, at a key time when the Lord shows me to. I go, well, why is it happening? And Paul looked down. He said, without even better now, he just looked down. And he goes, because the Lord said uh, he was thinking those things, and I'm his friend, and he just wanted to tell me. I went, oh. <laughs> I said, boy, I, I got the whole wrong paradigm of everything. And then later, you know, as I talked to him more about it, he goes, Mike, the Lord gives lots of information just because we're friends. That's how he wants to do that with his people. He goes, one of the problems is that uh, the Lord, uh, when he begins to talk a little bit, they tell everybody everything. And it's not even about friendship with him and the Lord. And he goes, and sometimes it's just about friendship because the Lord knows it. And he wants to tell somebody. He wants to tell a friend. And uh, or he or I, I wouldn't say it makes it like the Lord's lonely. I don't mean it that way. But he says the Lord told me because I am his friend. Let's say it that way. Uh, and in, anyway, so so we're back to this. Uh, we're going back to Bob Jones. It's now it's March 85 again. And so the Lord uh, is dominus. He has this written on him. I'm the Lord. And he says, Bob, he says, I'm going to reveal healing power in context of friendship, tender friendship. And he says, uh, then he told him. He said, in, in, this, in, this, in Kansas City, he just told him that. Again, uh, I just have to say it every time. It's going to happen in cities all over the earth. But he was just talking about Kansas City. He said, I'm going to release healing power to complete what was began in the healing revival. Now, some of you uh, maybe have not heard of the healing revival. There was a, I'm just saying approximately 30 ministries. Some could say as many as 100, but probably 25 or 30 prominent ministries in the 1950s that was uh, called the healing revival. And Gordon Lindsay had a magazine called The Voice of Healing, and they all were kind of uh, signed up, and they were the official sp- you know, uh, link, officially linked. People like T.L. Osborne and Raymond T. Ritchie and A.A. A. Allen and uh, Oral Roberts, William Branham, people like that were uh, uh, connected. Paul Kane was. He was one of the youngest ones. And they were part of the healing revival. These 25 or 30 ministries, they had big tents, 5, 10, 15,000, filling them up, signs and wonders. And it, it, was, it was quite, a, uh, quite a, a deal going on. Matter of fact, uh, another bunny trail is that uh, in the healing revival, I mentioned this, uh, I think, the other night, when Paul Kane was in his late 20s, uh, he went to Karlsruhe, Germany in 1957, and he had 17 nights of meetings and had as many as 30,000 a night at the end. You know, it started off smaller, 20, 10, and 20,000. Signs and wonders were breaking out so powerful. They had 30,000 in the tent, and they pulled the sides up, and he was preaching, you know, as a, uh, as a young uh, boy prophet. He started when he was 18. Now he's about 27, I think, about that time. And uh, his ministry is going forth all in, in very dynamic ways with signs and wonders in the healing revival. Now, I went to Karlsruhe, uh, Germany, just some years ago uh, and did a conference uh, with Paul Kane. And uh, uh, actually, I've been there co- twice to do conferences over the years. And, uh, of course, it's so dear to Paul because that was one of the great uh, places the Lord visited him in power. And, and some of the guys, uh, 80 and 90 years old or whatever, I don't know how uh, elderly men uh, – are come to the meeting because they heard Paul Kane, and I'm talking to him. You know, Paul is, I mean, Paul doesn't really know him, but they're saying, oh, man, we were at the meetings back when you were just a boy preacher and the miracles. We've talked about them for years, and I said, this is amazing, and of course, Paul smiled. It was kind of a fun thing, and that, that happened on two different occasions where I heard the stories firsthand from just people that were at the meetings that came, and I said, what is it, you know, is it true there were 30,000? They said, I don't know, but boy, they, it was real big and miracles and blind eyes opening. And, and, and uh, anyway, it was just a, a, a neat testimony. And so the healing revival really was something powerful. Paul says it was only pure for about two years. 
He said, if, if I had to really be honest, I would say from about 1950 to about 1952, of about the 20 years that are kind of labeled the healing revival, probably two. And he says, I knew most of them. He was one of the younger guys in it. Most of them uh, got off into corruption, not all the ones I mentioned. There's about 25 or 30. Most of them uh, went for the, the girls, the gold and the glory, the three Gs. They went for one way or the other, and they got off. And that's one thing that Paul was so disheartened by. So anyway, the Lord says, because Bob understands the healing revival, I understand the healing revival, meaning I've read books on all these guys, and Jack Coe's another name that's a real famous one, and I've read a number of their biographies, and and uh, very exciting and, and inspiring the front end. The front end is, of course, the back end isn't. But when you hear how they sought the Lord and the miracles, and yes, yes, and so Bob uh, the, the Lord speaks to him. And he says, what I began in the healing revival, I'm going to complete. I'm going to complete. And that's what the Lord's, but he says, I'm going to use friendship with my heart. I'm, or I'm going to, I'm, I'm, it's not a direct quote, but he says something like, but in the context of friendship is the message. I'm going to complete what I began in the healing revival. Bob is so excited. So now, you know, I've known Bob now two years, and so my question always, and it doesn't happen. Actually, most times it didn't happen. I'm just telling you the times it did. Many, many, many times it didn't happen. But I, I sometimes it did. This thing, I said, will God confirm it? Will God confirm it? And many times God did not confirm the things Bob said. I don't want you to have this idea that he had this uh, unbroken flow of revelation. You know, when you tell... 30 stories in 12 nights, it seems like that's all it was. But let me tell you, 83, 84, real intense. Maybe in 18 months, there were 10 or 12 stories in 18 months. That's real intense. And then maybe three or four or five the next year, and one or two the year after, and one or two the next three years. So don't have this idea that every day was some event. It's just not true. But when you hear them all in a row, you get that wrong impression. And uh, uh, Bob said things that were wrong sometimes. I don't mean he said the Lord told me. He said, I think this is going to happen, and this is my opinion, and if I was the Lord, I would do that. And it was all totally, well, sometimes it was pretty good, and sometimes it wasn't as good. Okay, just like all of us. But I don't want to give a false idea about those days because hearing them all one in a row, you can really get a wrong idea. So I said, will he confirm this? And Bob says, well, uh, actually, he said the Lord told me he would. He said, he is going to confirm this. I go, really? Because I was kind of asking, you know, by rote, not that I thought the answer would be yes. I, I just learned to ask that question all the time. He goes, yeah. He goes, the Lord's going to reveal himself to you. And a good friend of mine, Bob Scott, Kyle, Kyle Wager, that's his, Kyle, Kyle's dad. Go ahead and stand up and put your chest out. Okay. <laughs> Kyle, how old were you in March 85? Three. Three. Okay, you're a little whippersnapper. He was right because we... He was right there. We lived next door to each other. I won't go into that. But uh, so uh, uh, he says he's going to he's talking to me and Bob Scott and there's several of us. But he says he's going to visit you, too. He says, really? He says, yeah, he's going to tell you two things. He's going to reveal the healing anointing and he's going to show himself to you as a friend. He said and he told me he would. I go, really? Because I was just kind of saying, will he confirm it? Just, you know, that's just a good thing to ask. And he goes, he's going to show you himself to you as a friend. He says, but don't, uh, he goes, you, 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 you're very inexperienced in the things of the spirit, in the spirit realm. He goes, I didn't know it was the Lord when he stood in front of me. And I've, I've seen several angels over the years, but I knew something was up because you may not even understand what's going on at all. So the Lord wants me to tell you, he's coming to you as a friend. And Bob says, I think he's going to be standing before you as a, as a friend, Dawn. For Dominus, he's going to just do that. He's a, the Lord's uh, uh, filled with prophetic poetry and parables. So when the fr- your friend Don stands in front of you in a dream about healing anointing, he says it's a little tip off. More going, more is going on than just you having a dream about your friend. It's the Lord communicating friendship to you. And so we had a good laugh about that. And and uh, and so there you have it. Okay. So then a month goes by and Bob Scott. Kyle's dad uh, comes about, it's about a month later, whatever. And uh, he says, Mike, he goes, I had an incredible dream, incredible dream about healing power breaking in. He goes, it was amazing because he didn't have, uh, he had very few spiritual dreams as, as uh, was true of me as well. I'd maybe had one or two now by then or three at the most, whatever. 
And uh, he had had one or two, and it was so exciting. It still is so exciting. And he says, this was incredible. He goes, it was so clearly the Lord. He goes, the power of God was breaking out all over the city, and this and this and this. And he says, although I saw people praying and people falling and healings and rejoicing and crowds or whatever, and uh, uh, I don't remember all the details, but I just remember how excited he was. He says, and the only face that, st- that stood out to me, Though it was highlighted over and over through the dream, and it's, it's, it mystifies me. It was my uh, really close friend in St. Louis, and he, he says, Don, now uh, we're not thinking of a month ago. And I go, really? He goes, Bob says, maybe he's going to move here. He goes, you know, because we're really close friends, and he loves healing. And uh, so we talked to Bob Jones that day, and Bob goes, no, I told you a month ago. He says, the Lord's trying to connect in your understanding. There's a healing anointing coming. Greater works than these in context of friendship with God. Bob goes, oh, yeah. He goes, huh. He goes, oh, man, I can't go there. He goes, my good friend, Don, he can't be the Lord. And, and he says, no, your friend isn't the Lord. He said, the Lord's wearing the face of a friend to talk to you. He goes, was he smiling? And Bob said, yeah, he was grinning the whole time. He was smiling. He goes, and Bob says, I told you that when Dominus, when the Lord stood before me in the face of a friend smiling and grinning and happy, he goes, he goes, was he smiling? And that, and, and that was the real key point there. And Bob goes, yes, he goes, I remember that. And I said, wow. And he says, well, Bob, Mike is going to visit you too. He says, you've got a friend named Don. And he says, and you're going to see something powerful is going to happen. So it's a couple weeks later. And uh, it's on a Saturday night. So many of my things happen on Saturday night because we all gather on Sunday. It's just the Lord's wanting, uh, you know, I, when I look at the stories, I'm just looking. I go, they're always happening on Saturday night. I'm just kind of putting that together even in this 12-day session. And the Lord's saying, yeah, I want to connect it with others. I want a lot of you involved in this. I want the drama bigger than you. And so uh, uh, in this dream, very powerful dream about healing, I mean, really exciting one. I'm in a very large building, much bigger than the MCF Auditorium, which is about 2,000. It was a lot bigger than that. And I'm at the back, uh, standing against the wall, looking at the worship team up front. I don't notice any of the, I don't recognize any of the worship leaders up front. And uh, uh, they're all up there, mostly young people, and they're worshiping. And, I'm, and everybody's sitting down, and there's just thousands of people in this room, a quite large building. And I'm leaning with my back against the wall, and my one of my very best friends, Don Stedman, is leaning, is back there with me. I look at him, and he's smiling. He doesn't say any words. And everybody's sitting down, and I look at him, and, he, and he's just got a big smile. And so then, suddenly, the atmosphere, I, my guess is it's one of the uh, auditoriums downtown. That's just a guess. I don't know that it is. The, the uh, atmosphere suddenly changes. It's charged with the Holy Spirit suddenly. It is charged with the Holy Spirit. And there's no need for the worship team to stop. They keep worshiping. There's no altar call. And people start standing and running to the front. And they're crying out to God. Some for deliverance. Some I love you. Some heal me. Some whatever. They're crying out just hundreds, hundreds out of thousands and thousands to start running up front. And I look at Don, he's smiling, he's looking at me right in the eyes. I, I remember I'm, I'm taken by, he's staring at me right in the eyes with a big smile. And I said, I have to go. And he just looks at me, doesn't say anything. So I go running down the aisle, this is, I can remember this so clearly. And there's maybe 10 or 12 aisles, meaning way over there there's a big aisle. And way over there there's probably five or six aisles that way. And five or six aisles that way is a big auditorium. And as I'm running down the aisle... People are running down front. The worship team hasn't even, uh, they're just got their eyes closed worshiping God. There's about 10 or 15 of them up there. They don't even, they're not even paying attention to what's happening. And as I'm running, everyone starts running or, or kind of not uh, walking fast, uh, 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 running slightly. And I put my hand in front of me as I'm jogging up there and I go, in the name of Jesus, and I don't know, 30 of them. I mean, some large number, 20, 30. They just go, whoom, under the power of God, and they all fall on the ground, and they're healed. And I am struck by this. And as I'm running up there, I mean, 10, 20, 30 of them, whoom, they hit the power of God, hits them. And, uh, and those that were sick are healed instantly. And I'm, and I'm still jogging, kind of, and I look behind, and there's 30, 40, 50, and I go, in the name of Jesus, in 20, 30 of them, whoom, they're, they're under the power of God. They just, they fall on the ground. Whoa, and they're healed. And I'm going, this is intense. 
And so then, you know, the people in the front and the people in the back, although there's still some running that didn't fall down. And I look over to one of the aisles and I just said, hey, it's happening. Let's go for it, you know. And I said, in the name of Jesus, I put my hand over one of the sections and five rows of people, whoom, they all fell out of their chair under the power of God. Five full rows all fell on the ground and the power of God overwhelmed. They're on the ground crying out and glory, Jesus, I'm healed, I'm delivered. I'm going, whoa. This is intense is what I'm thinking. This is intense. And I look over in the other aisles, you know, this vast auditorium or I, I don't know, uh, the other aisles over there. And there's a, there's a, a part of the team. They're running down the aisle doing the same thing in front. They're doing in the name of Jesus and behind them. And the same thing is happening. And rows of people are just falling out under the power of God all over the auditorium. And it was happening in all the aisles, up front, everywhere. It was just a holy, glorious pandemonium of healing and power. And the glory, the light of God's glory was breaking out and resting on people. And I go back, and I go against the wall, and I go, oh. I go, that was the Lord. And uh, my friend Don looks at me, and he goes, that was the Lord. And then I wake up. The alarm go, actually the alarm goes off the very second. He goes, that's the, uh, the Lord, the alarm to get up to get the sermon ready, uh, goes off. And, uh, the exact moment I, I, I do that, the alarm goes off. A perfect timing. And so then I go to the, uh, uh, church meeting that morning and am I jazzed or am I jazzed? I mean, I'm excited. No need for a sermon. I could have just gone back to bed, but I was so excited. And, uh, I haven't put it together, the dawn thing. I just think, my friend, we're going to do healing ministry together, and we are, and the other, the, you know, the Lord is going to be in the midst of us as well. So we go, we're, we're, we're meeting in the Shawnee Mission South High School, and it's end of May, middle of May sometime, and they're finishing, or first of May, whatever, they're having their spring play. The spring play has just been completed. And, and we're up front because we preached from the stadium. They had an elaborate ser- a series of... Uh, you know, theater, uh, curtains and all that kind of stuff. And we're over at the side talking and there's four or five people. Mark Hendrickson's there and I'm talking to him and they're up there. And I go, man, oh man, it was so incredible. I saw the heel. It's incredible. When this light thing hits, it's going to be massive. It's dead to death. So Bob Jones comes walking up because Sunday morning and he saw me talking around just kind of all energetic with three, four guys there. And he comes up and he goes, what, 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 what's going on? I said, oh, Bob, I had, it's like my second or third or fourth dream ever. I go, you know, but, you know, it's been like three or four in two years. It's picking up because it was like, oh, for 20. And now it's like three in four in two years. So my batting average has gone way up. And so I'm just having fun with that. It didn't exactly work that way. But it's such a, still such a new experience. But I tell you, it never, ever grows old. I said, Bob. Bob, I said, this was amazing. I said, I put my hand out and da 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 and the light and the healings and it was happening to everybody. And there's just all these young people on the platform leading worship. And he goes, yep, yep, that's it. He goes, I, I told you, I told you. And then I said, I went back and I said, and I have a friend and, uh, uh, named Don and I was leaning against the wall. And of course, Bob starts smiling because I hadn't connected yet. And because Don was in our church, he was uh, one of the, his father was one of the main leaders of the Kansas City Chiefs, and he was running the uh, Kansas City Chiefs. Don was my friend at about 27, running the Chiefs, not the football side, but the other side. And so he had a real important job and knew all the mayors and every, I mean, every, all the big guys in the city. And, and I said, I think me and Don are going to be doing this together. He goes, well, it's true. He goes, you and Don are going to do it together, but that's not exactly what the message is. He goes, you and Don will do it together, but that's not the point. He goes, I told you uh, about a month or about two months ago, the Lord's going to reveal himself to you as Don. I went, oh, he goes, and then Bob Scott had it a month ago. Remember, I went, oh, and he said, I said, I told you Don was coming to reveal healing to you. And I said, oh, my goodness. He goes, so I have no doubt Don will be with you, but there's another one greater than Don that is going to be with you. And so Mark Hendrickson, I can remember it so vividly, says, look, and he points at the ground. This is the oddest thing. The Lord is just having the best time with this. I have no doubt. Over at the very end of the stage, there must have been a sound tech, a curtain tech, if there is such a thing. Somebody over there named Don. Because in one foot letters, I mean, it had the words D-O-N. That's, I guess, like he wasn't real uh, 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 fast. So they said, Don, you stand here. And they had his name, Don. And I'm standing I'm standing like this with my feet right in the O. 
And Mark Henderson goes, look! And I went, ah! And I look, I go, no! This is not possible! I go, how did that happen? Oh my, this is strange! And the Lord, and Bob says, it's gonna get a lot stranger than that before this is over. So that was the, uh, what I call the Dominus, uh, story. And just the way the Lord did that, I mean, that, that was probably the most startling part. When I looked down, I, I almost had a heart attack. I almost couldn't recover to preach. When I was standing on the dawn, because the whole rest of service, I'm going, how did I get there? Who wrote dawn on tape? How did this happen? You know, just, it's so, and I just know the Lord's smiling. Okay. Smiling all the way through it. Okay, the next one. I'm going to give a, uh, it's on May 7th, 1989. May 7th, 1989. It's the anniversary, six-year anniversary of our solemn assembly. It's on May 7th. And uh, I'm standing in a circle of about uh, eight or ten, ten or twelve, whatever, leadership circle. It's people I know that I'm, I'm in leadership with and the Holy Spirit. And it's the Lord. I see the Lord. I, maybe it's the only time besides uh, one other time. Uh, twice I've seen the Lord in, in, uh, in uh, these kind of experiences. And, uh, so the Lord is, is standing there and he's, it's like the Dominus. He's smiling at me. He's smiling, but he's smiling, but I know it's the Lord. It's not a hidden thing. And he's just looking straight at me. So smiling. I loved it. And I did, we didn't hardly say anything. I just looked at him and he just kept smiling. And I love that part about God. I love all the other parts too, but all the dimensions of his personality. And the Lord said, put your hands out. And so I put my hands out. He put his hands in my hands and he says, go tell them this. I'm going to use the hands of my people. And he puts his hands in my hands. He goes, go tell them I'm going to use the hands of my people. And so, uh, it's like the, uh, the Habakkuk three thing, you know, the lightning coming out of the hands of the Lord Jesus is going to come out of the hands of the people. It's like the May 21st, 1983 thing. I told you yesterday when the fire hit my hands, it's the same idea. The Lord says, I'm going to use the hands of my people. Even in that one I just told you, the Dominus one, I'm lifting my hands up saying, in the name of Jesus, and just the fire of God was hitting him. I didn't see anything, but just the way people were all over the room, it was happening for everybody who was uh, uh, going forth in the healing ministry. And so then uh, I wake up that morning and, oh, it's exciting. It's, it doesn't have the same uh, level of drama as some of the others, but it's so encouraging. And then Bob Jones calls me up on the telephone. I just can't hardly imagine that, that this is, happens like this, but it, it does. He calls me up on the telephone and he says, Mike, he says, I saw the Lord. He said, the Lord visited you last night. He said, he touched your hands, didn't he? And I said, Bob, that is amazing. That happened. Now this, again, I've told you on the first night, maybe five to 10 times, I had dreams and Bob called me up the very day after or two days after and told me my dream when I told nobody my dream. And this is one of those examples. He called up, he says, I saw the Lord touch your hands. He put his hands on your hands, didn't he? And I went, oh, Bob, I, I don't know if I'm more amazed the Lord touched my hands or more amazed that the Lord told you he touched my hands. I am shocked right now. And he says, I didn't hear the message at all. He goes, I didn't hear what the message was. But he goes, I guarantee you, you can count on it. You can count on it. And uh, and the message was, the Lord says, I'm going to use the hands of my people. I, I just wrote for my own personal self here. Uh, the Lord has touched my hands three times. In May uh, 83, on, on this May 7th, 89, and, and one more, I'm going to tell you in a minute, on October 5th, uh, on October 5th, 1990. And all three times where the Lord has uh, touched my hands... Bob, every single time, the next time I saw him, he knew it, which was the, in two examples, it was the day after he knew it. The Lord showed him. And and I've never understood that fully why that has happened, except for the Lord, maybe is saying something like you, you just need to know, uh, you need to have your faith confirmed because you wouldn't, I don't know. I don't know why that happened. I'll just leave it there because that's the real truth. I really don't know. But three times out of three times. That the Lord has touched my hands. Bob has seen it in a sovereign, supernatural way and told me without me telling him anything about it. Okay, I'm going to go to the last one now. And then we're going to ask the Lord to touch people. It's October 5th, 1990. October 5th, 1990. This was a real dramatic one for me. It's early in the morning. I'm on a a trip uh, in in the UK with John Wember. It's his ministry trip. It's a... Perhaps the uh, biggest uh, ministry time in John Wimber's life. Uh, I've heard people say that. And uh, uh, 
and per, arguably the most significant one. And someone may have a different opinion about that. But uh, Paul Kane was there. I was there. There was a whole team of people. We had five large conferences, of which the large one was in London with seven or 8,000 people, and the other conferences. And then they had si- satellite conferences, and we were there 30 days. And over 50,000 people registered for conference and paid registration. So just get the grasp of, I mean, the scope of this. It's quite a, quite a, a ministry trip. And I've never had a 30-day period like that. So anyway, it's the very first day of the trip or the, or, or the uh, day before the first meeting. And it's early in the morning. And uh, I, uh, the Lord, uh, I mentioned it the other day how this works. He uh, catches me up in a trance like Acts chapter 10 with Peter, meaning you're awake. You're awake and suddenly you're in a dream state, but you hear everything and you're interacting like you're in full experience, but you're fully awake and you're aware of everything around you. And, but everything disappears to a dream state, although the, although you hear everything, it continues. And, uh, some people say they even see everything. I don't know how you could see that and still interact, but there's realms I know nothing about. Okay. So I'm in this trance and the Lord, the Lord uh, again is appearing to me. And uh, uh, speaking, uh, he speaks three things to me. The first thing he says to me, this was, uh, well, all three were very, very important, but this is a, a close to direct uh, quote. The other two, I'm just going to give the summary. Uh, the first one, he says, my kingdom will go forth in demonstrations of power. He looks me right in the eyes. He goes, my kingdom will go forth in demonstrations of power. And I'm really aware I'm looking at the Lord. And this is a ter- scary one. This is not the smiling Jesus of May 7th, 1989. This is not the smiling Dominus that's hiding uh, his glory and his brightness to communicate friendship to people who can't cope with anything bright. And, uh, <clears throat> but he looks at me, and, it, and it's not the full splendor of Jesus. Of course, John the Apostle felt like a dead man. But it was like, this is like, whoa, okay, okay, this is, whoa, uh, intense. He says, my kingdom, he says it strongly, my kingdom is, is, will go forth or will, or I will release, I don't exactly remember the verb, but my kingdom will go forth, and I remember demonstrations of power. And he's saying it with authority, and, and it, it strikes me. And then the next two ideas that he communicates to me, and these are, these are, these are uh, troubling ideas. I just want you to know that. And maybe for some of you in this room, it doesn't seem troubling, but this is a troubling idea from where I'm standing. He says, I'm going to confront my leadership with power if they have a controlled spirit. I'm gonna, and that's negative meaning. And, 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 and that, that's a summary of it. I'm going to confront... I'm going to confront leaders in my kingdom was the idea. That's not an exact quote. I'm going to confront them with power if they have a controlled spirit. And the idea is that they viewed, it's, it doesn't mean a, 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 a pastor on Sunday morning who cuts the worship one song early to give an, an extended announcement. That's not the control spirit we're talking about. We're not talking about that little uh, a petty little thing where I think the meeting should have gone a little longer and you cut it off. Not that. He's talking about something very, very prominent that's very, very uh, important part of the uh, the way the kingdom of God is operating in the world is that is God's shepherds deep in their heart. Many of them think they have a right of ownership to the people under them. That's the control spirit. I was very very aware of what he was talking about. He and, and the idea he didn't say it, but it was it, it was it was a, it was a uh, uh, upsetting or a that's not the right word. It was a uh, unsettling unsettling idea. The idea, many, many, many of my shepherds that I have blessed and anointed, they have this idea that the people, the hundred or the five thousand or the million under them are somewhere they have a right to them somehow was the idea. And I understood it clearly, although those were not the exact words. And he said, I'm going to confront with power leaders in my kingdom. And then he, uh, he says this idea. He says this word. I mean, he just says it. He says, I have a controversy with my leadership. And I'm looking at him, and, I, and I'm thinking, who, me, Lord? You know, there's only one leader I know in the room right now that isn't you, Lord. <laughs> and I'm looking at him, and it's, it's not a pleasant feeling. And, uh, uh, you know, the, you right out of that, you begin to really judge yourself. And I tell you, beloved, who's ever under you, you help them be great and get to the next place. Don't you dare... Use any of your authority, position, your power 
to even subtly manipulate them from doing what they believe or what seems to be the will of God. Don't you dare. Don't you dare. That's the Saul David collision. And I was very, very aware of that's what he was talking about. The Saul and David collision in the kingdom. The David leadership being raised up. The Saul leadership going out of style. It's not, it's right, right now it's still kind of in style. The Saul leaders, but it's not always going to be that way because the Lord is going to see to it. And I, after that experience, I said, Lord, I, not that I've done it perfectly by any means, but I said, Lord, I've got to get on the side of the people under me to help them get to the next realm that the, where, where they're supposed to be, the next place. If it's not here, it's there. That's why when I went to the uh, pastor's meeting and uh, introduced IHOP, I said, here's my rule. Any of you can come to IHOP anytime you want and recruit any worship leader, singer, anyone you want. You never have to add, ask me. I can be the last to find out by email. They are not mine. They are not mine. And that's something that I've wanted to maintain that kind of freedom because that's the only place where there's going to be power in the positive sense. And uh, the Lord says this. He goes, I have a controversy with my leaders. It was at this time, I mean, in this, uh, uh, on this October 5th day, in the wake of this, the Lord says, I am raising up an international family of affection. It was in this, uh, in the, uh, uh, just actually the trance was over and it just came resounding through my being. So I know it was still the uh, overflow of, of that anointed experience where he said, I am raising up an international family of affection. And it was so strong. I'll add it. Thus says, says the Lord on that. It wasn't just an anointed, I, I mean, just a, a good idea. I heard it from the Lord. And, uh, and that's why the Lord says, I'm going to cause the, it, it, I'm just using this analogy, uh, <clears throat> like in the royal families, uh, hypothetically, from one nation would marry, the, the, the children would marry of another nation, and the idea is they would have peace. Never worked out that way, but uh, uh, the Lord says, I'm going to raise up my anointed ones from one tribe and one stream and have them uh, intermarry, cross-pollinate with people of other streams. I'm raising up an international family of affection, and my leaders must help them get to the place and not resist them is the idea. They have to help them. I'm raising up an international family of affection. Okay, so he says, my kingdom will go forth in demonstrations of power. He says, I have a controversy with my leaders. I'm going to confront them with power. And then uh, he says the third thing, because the international family of affection came just a, a moment after the trance was over. He says, they must cast their crowns down. They must cast their crowns down. That's why I was leading us in that. That idea was in my mind today because I was preparing for this and it was just like fresh on me. The idea is that they have, the idea is, not a direct quote in the trance, but the idea they have to be in agreement with my heart. They have to be in agreement with my power. They have to. Because if they get crosswise with this, I will use my power to move them in a way to free my people. And, uh, uh, and I had this cry in intercession, awake, the trance is over, but I know again it's anointed. Let my people go. I knew I had an anointed cry in prayer and intercession. Let my people go. Let my people go. And the Lord wants, again, we're not talking about how a leader leads a, a prayer meeting or a worship meeting and they missed it. That, that The Lord has so much mercy on that kind of stuff. We're talking about having a deep, profound sense of a right over the value, the resource, the destiny, the energy, the impact of those that we raised up under us. And the Lord says, don't you dare. Don't. I am raising up an international family of affection. It is critical that I take one from this stream and marry them into another stream. Do not get in my way. I have a controversy with my leaders. And I was crying out in intercession, let my people go. Speaking for the Lord, just in private intercession, you know, just, just that morning. But I, I just can feel it right now. That cry was important. So now I tell this story. I mean, I'm just, whoa, you know, it's, it's nine o'clock or in the morning now. It's a couple hours later. And I, Bob, I mean, uh, Paul Kane and John Wimber are there and I tell him. And, and uh, uh, Paul says, well, the Lord uh, is telling me right now, as you're, as you're telling me this, he's going to release tokens of power right now. He's going to give mercy and give tokens of power. He's going to give mercy. He's going to back up this. Because he goes, I think it's really for, uh, still for another time. He says, we're not quite there yet, but he goes, there's going to be tokens of power even, even right now, uh, in these five confer, in these five big conferences in the satellite conferences. And I looked at John because he's the leader. I go, John, this is a little bit of a mystical experience. I mean, this is, I mean, uh, and it's confrontive. You know, here I am, uh, you know, a, uh, American coming over here, you know, uh, 
you know, I don't, you know, I don't have PhDs. I haven't been in ministry 40 years and I'm talking to a lot of older guys. John, it's your platform. He says, go for it. Go. I said, I was kind of hoping you wouldn't say that. He said, go for it. I said, the whole thing. He says, the whole thing. I said, I have a controversy with you. And he says, say it. I went, really? I go, okay. So I only did it three times of the five major times I did it in Cardiff and Edinburgh and then London. And I'm going to just uh, comment on the Edinburgh one because this is what really happened. And there were many, many witnesses. And this is only a token. That's why I'm telling you. Well, the truth is, is, is timeless. But there's a token. And this power demonstration is going to increase far more. So I get up there in Edinburgh. I remember it's a 2 o'clock afternoon session. Right? A couple thousand people at the conference there. I just tell it. You know, here I am, an American. I'm in Scotland. There's two or 3,000. A lot of leaders. And I just kind of close my eyes or... Pretend like I'm praying or something. I don't know. It was kind of in, tough to do. I have a controversy with my leaders in the UK, you know, was the idea. And I said, he have a, a controversy with my leaders. And, and I got through the whole thing. And I just had people stand. And I, I, I mean, I'm really uncomfortable, you know, because I've, that's very confrontive. I'm saying, thus says the Lord. I'm new with them. They don't know me. I don't know them. And, uh, and they stand up. I say, stand up. And they stand up. And, and I'm just, you know, you think, well, you feel annoyed. No, I feel embarrassed. I feel nervous. I just said this. And, and a lot of uh, powerful established ministries there I have no relationship with. And I give this kind of word at that level. And I say nothing. And I'm just standing there. And there's no uh, nobody, uh, no worship team. Or we're just standing there. And uh, I don't say word. I just look down. I, I, I'm just kind of like, I, I got to get out of this. You know, I'm in the vineyard. We got to do ministry time. They do ministry time every time I'm stuck. I don't say a word. I look down. And, uh, uh, and uh, as they're standing, hundreds, I'm talking hundreds, not a thousand, but two, three, four hundred, hundreds. The power of God starts hitting them. I'm not saying anything. I'm looking. I'm looking down and I look up. And they start screaming and wailing. And I mean, I'm thinking maybe 20, 30, 40, or probably closer to 50. There were men, grown men laying on the floor, writhing as demons were coming out of them. They were in full power encounters in front of their people. I mean, demons. It was, it was more demons than anything else. Slithering, writhing, barking, it's like snakes hissing. And I'm going, I haven't said a word. And there's a power encounter. And this thing goes on 30 to 40 minutes. Two, three, four hundred. I don't know the real name. They weren't, I mean, the number, but there were not all pastors, many. But it, I, the thing that struck me is I said nothing, and it was mostly demons that God, the Holy Spirit, was confronting. Of course, it's in mercy. It, it, it was delivering them, but it was also establishing something as well. And I was watching it, and people, again, uh, the power of God, I, that's the hallmark thing. I said nothing. Because I know we're, we're many times we're supposed to say things because the Lord wants to establish the partnership with the ministry. He wants to connect that it's intimacy with him. So he does want us to touch them with our hands and say things. But uh, people were, were getting thrown back by the power of God. Again, not hundreds and hundreds at like this level, but 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, just up there. They're, they're just falling back in chairs and, you know, uh, actually it was on uh, uh, theater seats. And they were falling back and people were screaming and wailing in the whole room. And, and people, the leaders were around and uh, going, this is truly amazing. And I said, uh, afterwards, it was the 2 o'clock session. I said, I don't have a clue what happened. And Paul says, no, Mike, you have to understand what happened. He goes, it's not about you. This is the Lord's word and he is going to release power on this word in the days to come and the power is going to be released for signs and wonders but there's going to be a power to create separation of people who will not free the people of god into their destiny and so then that's that happens uh at 10 you know maybe it's 10 days later is the big london one the seven or eight thousand one in the docklands and it's i get the two o'clock session I, I remember it well and i remember what happened in edinburgh and none of them were there so i got an idea what might happen and so uh, I did it a little bit different because I was a little bit bolder because the Lord was really backing this thing up. And Paul Cain said, go for it. And, and John said, go for it. Go for it hard. Don't back away. And, and uh, so I uh, called him. This time I didn't have them all stand up. I mean, I, I guess I did. But I said, leaders only come down. Leaders only. So maybe, you know, out of the seven or 8,000 people, there's hundreds and hundreds of leaders. I said, if you've struggled with the idea of releasing people, I said it kind of nice. 
And uh, I was thinking something might happen, and the same thing happened. It was not at, at the full level of, of Edinburgh, but it was intense. Demons, pastors, writhing, lady pastors, men pastors, 50, 60, 70 years old, falling, screaming, five and eight at a time, shooting back, and just their body like a piece of bacon on a skillet, power encounters. And, I, and I'm not saying anything. I'm just standing there. I told the story. I gave the whole story and said nothing, just like Edinburgh. I said, I'm going to watch this. I'm going to see. And, uh, and, and afterwards, Paul said, the Lord wants you to know how absolutely zealous he is going to break in in power on this issue when he's ready for it. He says, but he's going to give his people a chance. But he's going to break in for power, for the, for the salvations, of course. But the same power that, that sets the captives free is going to be a power that's going to confront. And, it's, of course, it's mercy because it's delivering them from demons. But some of them didn't feel like that when they were down there. They were like a little bit like... You know, the, you know, the prim and proper, you know, well, that wasn't very English gentlemanly, was it? Uh, and, uh, but I, I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. I just watched. I just watched. Okay, I'm going to end with this. I'm going to end with this in, in 60 seconds. I'm going to give you these 18 words, okay, in a row. We got about one minute left, right, on the tape. Okay, it starts off four prophetic words from Augustine, and then Bob Joan comes uh, right after and says it. Thousands of young people, the nine gifts of the Spirit, and the other two words. Next, May 21st, 1983, with the Psalm 28, the solemn assembly, the fire hits the hand, and uh, the Lord says, no disease known to man. Paul Cain uh, has the uh, Joel's army over the MCF building. He sees the stadiums filled, Joel's army. The next one, he sees the stadiums filled a hundred times, he says, uh, but that's not an actual number, where signs and wonders were breaking out and the, uh, and the uh, newscasters were saying it. Howard Pittman in heaven on August 79, the audible voice of God says, signs and wonders greater than Elijah. They will do greater works than my son did. Go and tell them. And, and then he understands later through several other things. There's a group uh, on May 7th, 1983. And when Hit Pittman came, he says, the Lord wanted me to give this to you because the Lord sees you as a Gideon's army. He says, you're going to see greater works than these and miracles more than Elijah. July 3rd, the procession down Blue Ridge, starting uh, where Har Harris Truman's farm was and, and going to the stadium and the, the healing procession with the miracles and the people pushing the wheelchairs instead of being in them. And uh, 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 then the uh, next one is my experience right after that in August 84, where the Lord shows me the apostles and p apostles means healing. That's this. It's not all it means, but if there's apostles and there are apostles coming forth, there's healing. May 7th, 1989. I'm going to tell my people I'm going to use their hands. I'm going to use the hands of my people. The next one, March 85. I don't have them in chronological order. I can see uh, Dominus. Dominus, tell them. I'm going to release great healing power, greater than the, uh, I'm going to complete what I began in the healing revival. It's going to be great signs and wonders. The next one, just the revelations I'm going to tell tomorrow, the next day, about how God joined us to the compassion and worship anointing of the vineyard, which is all about signs and wonders. The next one, Habakkuk 3, 4, in June 80, uh, August 82, Bob Jones sees fire coming out of the hands. I didn't mention this. Mark DuPont came and gave me the same word, Habakkuk 3, 4. That's another story. I didn't, I forgot. I just saw it here. October 5th. Oh, I forgot to mention this. The one I just had in, in Edinburgh, England. I, I, I mean, in, in a, a, a Cardiff Wells, but it's when I was in Edinburgh. Uh, uh, I, I spoke it on October 5th, 1990. I come back home from the trip. I come back home from the, I forgot all about this. I get off the airplane because I have a wedding. I, I get off the airplane in a minute. I go straight to the air, you know, wedding like this. Bob Jones at the wedding. He says, so he said, uh, I see that, uh, the Lord took you up on Jacob's ladder and told me that he's going to release power to deal with the Jacob spirit. He goes, there's a swindler spirit that's going to be dealt with in power. And, uh, that, that's another story. But, uh, Anna Kane dies on April 18th, gets Luke 418 at 418 in the afternoon. Uh, the other one, over and over, Bob Jones has seen this prayer movement is going to have the uh, what Paul Cain called the presence worship in the meetings. Bob Jones has seen it many times when the angel visited him in August uh, 75, says that when they get into worship, signs and wonders will take place. The one I, I haven't told yet till the next couple of days is the blueprint prophecy, the black horse and white horse prophecy I didn't tell yet. Uh, the Bob Jones one, the Lord appears and says, there will have be no end to the lines 
And then the other one I shared the other day when the Lord speaks to Paul Cain and says the church without mixture will have the spirit without measure and the majesty of God, the idea is going to break forth in a full power. Those are all supernatural experiences that guarantee us that's our invitation and that warn us to live a lifestyle of servanthood and a lifestyle preparing to take uh, controversy, to take pressures because the Lord is going to, he's going to maintain our intimacy with him and he's going to protect us with power, with pressure. If these things happen in our midst, then they will come to pass. They will come to pass. The Lord will not um, uh, treat us differently than he did his servants of old. There will be great pressures that will come to uh, keep us in the place of agreement with his heart as servants and in humility and in friendship and intimacy. Amen and amen. Let's stand.